Hello, I'm Dr. Miguel Gates. I'm the program chair for cyber engineering. And I would like to welcome everyone to the 2020 Senior Capstone Projects. Uh, we have three really good projects from our most brightest uh, cyber engineering students today. And I hopefully you guys will enjoy them. A couple of quick points of order before we start. For those who are interested in evaluating the projects, there is a link inside of the chat. Feel free to evaluate whether you are an advisory board member, a student, or just a family or friend. Also keep in mind that no one will be allowed to speak during the presentations, so everyone has been muted. If you would like to ask a question, either put it in the chat or raise your hand and I'll be glad to service you when the time for question and answer comes. With that being said, I want to introduce to you our very first team. We have our SWANS team, which stands for the Secure Wireless Apparatus Network System, headed by Haley Wickman. I will now hand control over to her. You're in the hands of SWANS. Good afternoon, everyone. We are the bevy of SWANS. My name is Haley Wickman, and I'm accompanied by Alexandra Duran-Chicas, Zachary Guillot, Andrew Theodos, and Paul de Solaire. Our senior design project was the Secure Wireless Apparatus Network System, or SWANS for short. For this presentation, we will start with the overview, which will consist of how SWANS works, the ethics and constraints of SWANS, current systems compared to SWANS, and the overall costs. After this, we'll move into the design of the prototype. From there, we'll go into the final design components of SWANS, which will further explain the model and its parts, how power, power management was implemented, the software that was developed for SWANS, and the security used uh, and further explained into elliptical curve cryptography. After this, we will show a recording of the video demo and then a conclusion. This slide contains a specific list of each member's contribution to the project. First, we have Haley, who, as our team leader, worked in the implementation of hardware, software, encryption such as the elliptic curve cryptography, and in our SWANS logo design. Then, we have Paul, who worked on hardware and software, specifically in app development, as well as in research and video editing. We also have Andrew, who worked on hardware and software, specifically in the app design and development, as well as in research. Next, we have Zachary, who worked on hardware, specifically on the model system and power management, as well as in research and the naming of the project. And finally, Alexandra, who worked on hardware, the documentation such as slides and the report, and in research. So, what is SWANS? SWANS is an easy to use tool that monitors and manages the properties of chemicals in industrial processes. The data gathered from the sensor readings is encrypted. Therefore, the device is secure. SWANS is also wireless and economical compared to the sensors used in industry today. To communicate, SWANS uses the ESP8266 Node MCU board. This board establishes a Wi-Fi connection in which, is, in which information is securely sent through a client-server network to our own mo mobile application. SWANS consists of three sensors, temperature, flow rate, and pressure, and has been designed to monitor any given chemical. In this case, all sensors are monitoring water. If an error occurs, SWANS will show that the data is out of the user-specified thresholds and will immediately send an alert. Okay, so SWANS works by um, our mobile application making a connection with the Wi-Fi boards that we have. So once a connection is detected, then it auto-populates the pages with all of the, and allows the user to set parameters based off of what they want. And, it and the reading uh, looks at that parameter and um, changes the background to green. So while it's monitoring, if it, at any point the reading gets within 5% of the lower or upper bounds, it will turn the background to yellow and continue monitoring. As long as it does not fall within that 5%, it'll stay green. If at any point the reading gets outside of the, the boundaries, it turns the background to red, sends an error notification and an audible beep every 10 seconds until the reading gets back within the lower and upper bounds.
In order to establish the project's groundwork, it was important to examine different categories and their possible effects in the following areas. SWANS is compliant with the NIST cryptographic standard and guidelines development process and with the Federal Information Processing Standards Publication 180-4. The first one emphasizes the principles, processes, and procedure, procedures of cryptographic standards, while the second one is a guideline to implement SHA-256. Regarding our hardware and sensor usage, SWANS is also compliant with the IEEE standard for sensor performance parameter definitions which are guidelines about the common framework for sensors, performance, terminology, units, and different conditions. SONS is relatively small, and it must fit inside an electric storage box. When closed, the lid is secure with screws and completely waterproof. SONS is power efficient, meaning it has minimal environmental impact. With quality in mind, SONS has been tested to produce stable and consistent results. Sensor handling should always be simple, especially at the time of manufacturing, installing, and replacement. Swans should be low cost. In order to achieve the goal of producing a cost-effective device and an alternative to the already existing sensor systems. Lastly, Swans seeks to, seeks to use and the process of installation by allowing sensors anywhere without unnecessary wiring. So one of the main goals of SWANS was to produce a cost efficient, a, very, a relatively cost, low cost solution to wireless communication. So currently many systems cost a large sum of money. One such example is the Rosemount Gateway, which is used for wireless heart. It's all very much used in industry and it costs about $5,000 for a gateway. SWANS, on the other hand, is $250, includes gateways, sensors, and three nodes. Now, it may be curious to why we decided to compare ourselves against the Emerson's Rosemount gateway. The main reason we chose to do this was due to the fact that we actually were able to talk with them and get to see the Emerson gateway in action, and we kind of used it to help base what we, what we did going forward from that point. You can see on the list provided, swans can be produced for a little bit over $60 with all the parts that we have listed here. That's for the nodes. Now, assuming that we could get bulk pricing, we might be able to cut that cost down to around $50, which allows us to produce a relatively cheap node for implementation. Additionally, swans can be deployed on any wireless network so if a company was to use, say, the Cisco router, which after talking with um, engineers in the control systems field, they do use, they could implement it on that system without having to buy their own gateway. And many companies provide smart devices, such as a Samsung device, that would allow them to interface with swans from anywhere on the planet. So this is the SWAN uh, early SWAN prototype. It consisted of a cir plastic circular container that was used to model a reservoir that may be used in a chemical facility. Connected to the reservoir on either side are PVC tubing that flows into a 12 volt pump, which then flows into a flow rate sensor and back into the reservoir. And a temperature sensor was is placed uh, directly into the reservoir from the opening of the top. The circuitry for the prototype consisted of, a, uh, of the flow rate sensor and temperature sensor which were both connected and powered by the Arduino, while a 200 ohm resistor was connected in parallel with the temperature sensor uh, to help with computation. And a Bluetooth module was connected to the Arduino to communicate between the tablet. The prototype uh, utilized Blue Term terminal app uh, to display improved communication between the Arduino and the Android tablet was possible. And our prototype mobile application was only a framework at that time for uh, future work or for future uh, reference. Uh, for the final design, the Arduino was replaced with the ESP8266 node MCU Wi-Fi board, 
which is an open source microcontroller consisting of 128 kilobyte memory and a four megabyte storage and utilizes, of course, the ESP8266 CPU. The temperature sensor uses a digital frequency to simulate, or yeah, simulate analog and the flow rate sensor is a pulse base so they could both use a digital pen. Well, the pressure sensor that we added for a final design was analog. And the final design also used a resealable electrical box that contained all of the electrical hardware. The model we used to simulate um, a system that could be controlled for our final design was a two reservoir system. We chose to ch use clear plastic boxes so the water level could be seen in a demonstration. The first reservoir, which is on the left in the top image and the right in the bottom image, is our secondary water source. It has an inlet and an outlet, and it has the pump attached to it so that the water can be pumped from the first reservoir to the second reservoir. Our second reservoir, which is the main water chamber, has an inlet, an outlet, and, overflow, and an overflow valve. Additionally, a pressure sensor was added so that we could monitor the water level in the reservoir. The reason we chose a pressure sensor is because one foot of water exerts 4.3 PSI. So it was an ideal solution since our system is unpressurized. Additional parts of the project include, or additional parts of the model include a pump, which we said was used to, can, to flow water from reservoir one to reservoir two, a control valve that leads from reservoir two to reservoir one to keep water from flowing back into the first reservoir, and flow rate sensors to detect the flow through each line. The second reservoir is not pumped as can be seen in the first image because we expected gravity feed to work for reservoir two to reservoir one. Next, let's talk about power management. For power management, because these are these are small nodes, we had to consider ways to efficiently manage power. We talked about if the conditions are right, solar power, and potentially using waste heat through thermal power, just excess heat radiation off of engineering processes. But for our modeling purposes, we decided to use manual power switching just to keep the model simple and cost efficient. We use a double pull, double throw switch so that we can minimize downtime while switching power. So you could switch from one power source to the other, and then you could change the low power source. Okay, so this is our wiring for our final product. So we have a pressure sensor, which is set to the A0 pin on the microcontroller. It's powered by a nine volt power source. We have a temperature sensor, with, its res with the resistor set up to D2, that's powered by a 3.3 volt power source on the microcontroller. And then we have our flow rate sensor, which is set up to D6 on the board. And it's also set up to a nine volt power source. On the right, you can see that we have our two battery packs for our power switching. And the Wi-Fi board at the top of the screen has a uh, temperature sensor and a flow rate sensor hooked up to it because that's for reservoir one. The board on the bottom is for reservoir two, which has the temperature sensor, flow rate sensor, and pressure sensor all hooked up to it. Now I'm gonna talk about the software behind SWANS. The firmware for the Wi-Fi board was created using Arduino code and IDE. The flow of data from the sensors to the application is as follows. First, the sensor picks up the sensors pick up data readings, which are then read to the Wi-Fi board. It uses ECC for a key exchange and symmetric encryption to encrypt the data. The Wi-Fi board then sends the data over Wi-Fi to the specified IP in port to the Python server app. Finally, the data, once the data is there, it gets decrypted and added to a queue to be loaded to the TK Enter GUI um, so that the user can view it. To access the mobile application, the user must enter a username and password. The application uses a hash SHA-256 password comparison for correct logon authentication. Okay, so here's some screenshots from the final product of our app. So at the top of the screen, we have our login page with the username, password, and our logo on it. 
So the username is hard coded into the program and the password, it, what it does is it reads what's, whatever's typed into the entry for password, as it's SHA encrypts it, then it opens a separate text file that has the true password that's also SH, SHA encrypted. It compares the two hashes and if they match, then the password you entered was correct and it'll log you in. When the app first logs it in, all you see is a blank screen until it detects there's a connection with a Wi-Fi board. And then it auto populates the page like you see at the image at the bottom left of the screen with no parameters. And so after that, the user can input parameters and store them. And if you notice in the center picture, it shows the values that are stored and the current reading. And if the reading gets outside of the range, like the temperature in the picture, it changes the background to red and it sends an error message and continues to beep at you every 10 seconds, like the picture on the right. Now I'm going to explain elliptic curve cryptography. Elliptic curve cryptography is an encryption technique that provides encryption based on elliptic curves. Compared to RSA, it achieves the same level of security with much smaller keys. It's also more powerful, power efficient than RSA, which is good for nodes like these. It works by providing shared knowledge of an elliptical curve or a finite field defined by a large prime number and a point on the field. Um, it performs mathematical operations on two points of the curve to find where else on the curve the line intersects. So on the right side of the screen, you can see how Swans uh, does a key exchange using ECC. Um, the left side shows the server app application and the right side shows the client node application. So on the, on the server side, the server begins the thread and waits for incoming connections. And on the client side, it connects to the Wi-Fi and tries to connect to the server's IP. If it can connect, it'll establish a connection. Otherwise, it will continue to retry the connection until it can. Once a connection is established, the server generates a random private key and sends a public key to the client. This public key consists of an elliptic curve, a finite prime field, a, ran a starting point for the client to use, and a random point on the curve. Um, it then the client then receives this public key from the server and generates a secret shared key. This shared key is not yet known to the server yet because it does not have enough information. Um, the server or the client that can then encrypt the message using the server's public key and the shared secret key. It also generates a public key from the server's public key and sends that public key to the server. And this public key consists of two other points on the curve. Um, then the server uses this the client's public key and the server's private key to get that shared secret key. So now that they both have the shared secret key, they can use symmetric encryption and decryption. So on the client side, you see it can Zor encrypt temperature, pressure, and flow rate using that shared secret key. And on the server side, you can see it listening for messages. And when it receives the message, it can Zor decrypt using that shared secret key. And using that information, it can then update the temperature, flow rate, or pressure based on the received message. And as long as the connection is still active, it will continue doing this. Otherwise, it will try to reconnect to the server. This is more of a demonstration of, of like using print statements showing how uh, Swans is using ECC. So as you can see, the server sends an elliptic curve two points in a prime field to the client. The client then generates a shared key and calculates two points from the given information, which is C1 and C2, which are two points on the curve and sends that back to the server. The server can then calculate the client's shared key with C1 and C2. And then finally, the server and client can communicate via symmetric encryption with the shared key. Okay, we will now begin our demonstration. Due to the physical aspects of our demonstration, as stated earlier, we decided to record the demonstration instead of doing it live to respect social distancing and to help manage the demonstration. So I think we should begin the demonstration at this point.
Good afternoon, everyone. For our senior design project, as it was explained, we are doing a video demonstration. I'll start by explaining the physical aspects of our model. Our model consists of two reservoirs, both with inlets and outlets. These are to represent a control system that you might find at an engineering facility. This system has a pump attached to it to stimulate water flow from one reservoir to the other. Attached to the second reservoir is a control valve which allows you to control the water flow from the second reservoir to the first one. The overflow valve is in case the control valve is closed for long enough, water can still overflow to the original reservoir. Inside our system we have two sensors hooked up to these reservoirs. They are flow rate sensors. These flow rate sensors are in loop with our pump and our control valve to monitor the flow of water through the system. For managing the power of our system, we have two battery packs hooked up in parallel over a double pole double throw switch. When one power source becomes low, this allows us to change the power source that is powering our microcontroller so that we can minimize the downtime while we are changing the power of the system. The temperature sensor is wired to a 9 volt source. To read the data, we will need to add a 220 ohm resistor and to connect the read wire to D2, which is the digital pin 2 on the microcontroller and referred as GPIO4 in the code. Then we can wire it to ground. To add the pressure sensor into the system, we had to drill a small hole on the side of the reservoir. To work properly, this sensor needs to be connected to a 3.3 voltage source and to A0, which is the analog reading pin on the microcontroller. Then we connect it to ground. SWANS uses the ESP8266 Node MCU Wi Fi microcontroller for TCP IP communication between the sensors and the mobile application server. The Node MCU has 16 digital pins and one analog pin for data reading and writing and is Arduino IDE compatible. Here we have the login screen for our GUI mobile application. We have our SWANS logo and our username and password. The username is hard coded into the app and the password reads what is entered in the entry box, encrypts it with SHA-256. Then it takes that hash and opens a separate text file with the password also encrypted with SHA-256 and compares the two hashes. If they match, the password is right and it signs you in. When you log in, you are looking at a blank screen until a Wi-Fi board connects to the app. When it connects, it auto-populates at the top of the window. When multiple nodes connect, multiple pages will be created up at the top where you can easily switch between them. After several seconds, the application will start to display values that are being read from the sensor. After numbers have been input into the blank lower and upper bounds and store button has been pressed, the parameter values are changed and the background color of the value will change to green if within a comfortable range between the two values. When the parameters are changed to place the currently read values outside of the bounds, the background color will change to red accompanied by an audible notification and error message. When the boundaries are changed back, the notification sound stops and the background color changes back to green. To exemplify this feature further, water was heated and poured into the reservoir. As the sensor updates, the value background changes to yellow, notifying the user that the value is within 5% of one of the boundaries. The value then exceeds the upper boundary, which causes the background to change to red and again accompanied by an error message and tone. That will conclude our demo. We will now move on to the conclusion. So in conclusion, SWANS incorporates a mixture of physical and software components, which is a large portion of the idea behind cyber engineering. Cyber engineering aspects include the 
physical aspect, which are the electrical components and the modeling, which includes the reservoir, and the software components, which is our own application, our sensor code, and the elliptic curve cryptography implementation. We successfully found a low cost solution to monitor chemical properties of industrial processes, in addition to the secure wireless data transfer. The Rosemount uh, gateway, which was very expensive, used many, and is used by many uh, chem uh, chemical companies, costs $5,250. And this price does not include any of the other sensors or nodes. Swan's other, on the other hand, is a new secure device, which costs less than $250. This price includes an entire sensor setup, gateway, and three sensor nodes. And I will now open the, um, the board to any questions. So if you have a question, you can raise your hand and I will unmute you. Holden? I unmuted you. Can also you. pose any questions to the chat. I'm trying to unmute somebody, but it's not letting me. Oh, there. Holden had a question. I'll, I'll take care of it. Holden um, has a, a question. Um, Holden, ask your question. Holden, are you still there? It seems Holden may not be able to ask his question at the time. Are there any other okay. questions from the group? Oh, there he is. Go ahead, Holden. Yeah. Uh, can you go back to slide six for me? Yes. So, uh, for the codes and standards, you put that your uh, SHS compliant, correct? Yeah. Yes. Uh, so what about the FIPS compliance for um, the encryption of the elliptical curve? Did you verify that that was also compliant? Yes, we were able to verify different guidelines for encryption, especially the first ones are very general, which are the ones that follow the NIST cryptographic standards and guidance development process. So th that one specify almost um, every general case of encryption, but it is very new. So there's still not much information about it. Virginia Simono had a question. Virginia, ask your question, please. Oh, I don't know if she's, or, okay, well, Russ Mathers uh, had a question. Russ, would you like to ask your question now? Yeah, I was curious, um, uh, I saw you changing the temperature of the, the, the water in the system. Yeah. Um, just based on your thermo education and knowledge, uh, did you use any of your thermo uh, background as you studied the system? Uh, we did not do a bunch of research on the thermo aspects. Okay. Yeah, and this one may not have lended itself since it really wasn't truly a closed system since you had the, you know, the Rubbermaid bins, but, uh, you know, just changing uh, the temperature of the water could have changed your pressure of this system as well, which could have changed some of your feedings, but I don't think you would have seen the results in the Rubbermaid bins. You would have need more of a uh, truly closed system, something airtight. Very interesting though, thank you. Thank you for your question. Virginia, you seem to have gotten back. Virginia, do you have a question? I don't know, I think so. You may ask. Yeah, I like that. Any, 
So Josh asked the question, do you feel like your classes helped you to prepare for this project? Josh is one of the board members for the uh, Cyber Engineering Advisory Board. Oh, definitely. Um, I feel like the like CSC 301 helped with the crypt cryptographic aspect. Um, I know uh, Zach had a class that um, he yes. had a book for the for the ECC. Yeah, I took an elective with Dr. Galen Turner for an intro to crypto through mathematical perspectives, which helped us implement cryptography. The reason that helped us is because there really isn't any good library for encryption on Arduino. So we had to develop the encryption that we used for Arduino. Also CSC 450 was helpful with the networking aspect. And uh, Zach, did any of your classes help you with uh, doing the model? Um, I would say that the freshman engineering kind of gave me an idea of where to go from, but it, yeah, it kind of gave me an idea of how to fit things together, but I also did have to reach out to others in, that have done something similar before. But the freshman engineering class definitely would help you design a model. All right, our final question is from uh, Bill Bradley, who is also a member of our IAB. He asks, what is the biggest challenge you had to overcome in your effort and how did you resolve it? Um, Paul, do you want to explain that one? Uh, sure. So probably our biggest problem was whenever we were trying to implement the Adafruit Feather, which was our first choice to a alternative microcontroller uh, of the Arduino, since it used a radio module of 915 uh, megahertz. Uh, the problem we encountered with it is it had LoRaWAN, um, which uh, is its own network, uh, but we could not get the LoRaWAN gateway to work. Uh, due to our inexperience with it. Uh, so the way we resolved this is we went to a Wi-Fi board, which we had a lot more familiarity with around our, in our group. Yep. Thank you, guys. Well, we really appreciate the bevy of swans giving their very instructive presentation today. Um, if you have any other questions, feel free to put it into the chat and we can easily discuss those offline. But for now, we thank you for your presentation and we'll get ready to move to the next one. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Thank you Thank all. You. All right, so our next group coming up is uh, the blockchain gang, and they will be discussing their project today, Easy Vote Secure, led by Austin. So Austin, are you here? Austin Blanchard. All right, I'm slowly but surely bringing in the new group. Austin, are you here? Yes, Dr. Gates, I'm here. Awesome. The other members of the group should be in as well. Okay, well in that case, then the floor is yours. Um, do we need to go through, are they already unmuted or do I have to go through and unmute manually? Uh, they should have the, the co-host privileges, so they should be able to unmute themselves. Okay, awesome. Really quick before you start, for those who are interested in uh, evaluating this presentation, there is a link in the chat. Feel free to evaluate the students um, based on their performance. You can be, uh, it doesn't matter if you are a, a, a professor or administrator, a student, a family member, doesn't matter. Anyone can evaluate the students. So. Feel free to do such. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and start sharing my screen. Just go ahead and let me know when you're able to see it. I'm able to see it. All right. Joe, Rylan, Matthew, Colin, are you guys ready to go? Yep. Okay. 
Uh, Joe just said, it says the host has him muted. Okay. Uh, I have him. Good. Uh, he should be good to go. All good. All right, Matt, you there? That he's muted. Yeah. I think um, Matthew is still muted, Dr. Gates. He's not muted. Dr. Gates. Well, you want to make sure you unmute just the one that says Matthew Reed, not Matt Reed computer. He has two. Uh -huh. Okay. All right, you good now, Matthew? Yeah, sorry about that. All right. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Austin Blanchard, and I'm joined today by Joseph Bingham, Rylan Burleson, Matthew Reed, and Colin Sanford, and collectively we formed the Blockchain Gang. And today we're going to be presenting the project that we've been developing over the past several months named Easy Vote Secure. So before we get into the project, uh, we're gonna go over what we're gonna be planning to cover in this presentation. And we're gonna start off by going over the problem that we um, were planning to solve with this project. And we're gonna go over some background, including the current state of the voting machines, our project objectives and the blockchain, the technical aspects of the blockchain. And then we're gonna go into the design, including the considerations and the process that we followed and then we'll go into um, each component that makes up our project, including the interface tools, the authentication process, the blockchain and the hardware. And then we we'll have several demos um, lined up. We have a, a live user interface demo, and then we have um, a quick blockchain admin tool that we can show off that's currently in the command line. And then we have an end-to-end -end animation that goes through the process of how the blockchain network is working behind the scenes. And then we will go over the conclusion and the recommendations from our project, and then we'll open the floor to questions. So what problem are we aiming to solve with the Easy Vote Secure project? So we noticed that the current state of the voting system is outdated and definitely has the potential for major innovation with respect to security, costs, and voter turnout. And that is where we definitely wanted to aim to tap into that potential with this project. So I'm gonna hand things over to Joe so that he can um, fill you in on the background for our project. Joe? Thanks, Austin. Um, so just going into the background a little bit on the current state of voting machines, um, the, the first thing we noticed were security risks. And I think this is kind of something that, you know, is, is kind of pushed to the, the forefront of voting machines. Um, and really a lot of these security risks are just because these systems are outdated um, you know, and they have a lot of vulnerabilities. Uh, they're running software that it's no longer receiving updates or patches. Uh, an example is they found some voting machines are running Windows XP, which is just a little bit out of date now. Um, and that's mainly because technology is moving so fast. Um, in a study by the Brennan Center for Justice, they found that 42 states were using systems that were more than 10 years old. And, and you know, in today's kind of technology, world that's just i mean that's a, a long ways back um you know we also looked at cost uh, so the average cost for a new machine was between 2500 and about three thousand dollars um i i researched it and it, and it said the kind of state average to replace all their voting machines is pretty much in the range of tens of millions of dollars um which is just real hard for these states to to budget and get all that money um especially so frequently um because technology is moving so fast um, looking at reliability, a lot of the uh, hardware is outdated, um, which is unreliable during elections. You know, you have a lot of parts failing um, when they're needed. Uh, and, you know, a lot of these parts are older, so it just costs a lot more for maintenance. Um, and kind of all these things are ending up hurting voter turnout. Uh, you know, when the technology is not working, this damages voter confidence um, and it just leads to poor turnouts. Um, and that's just something, you know, you don't really want. You want as many people voting as you can. Um, so if we go to the next slide. So 
you know, after seeing all, all these kind of issues with the current mach machines, we, we wanted to look at what objectives we wanted to achieve. Um, the first thing is we wanted to increase security. So the way we did this was uh, by using a blockchain. Uh, this created a distributed consensus um, and it just kind of allowed us to have, have a distributed consensus and make sure uh, the, the votes being stored are what's being stored. You know, nobody's in the background changing anything. Um, we want to reduce cost uh, and the ways we kind of do this was just make the system more reliable, reduce repair costs, automate some of those jobs with the current voting process, um, and overall just utilize a high value, low cost system. Um, and then finally, we were hoping by, by achieving the things I, I previously mentioned, you know, we increase that voter turnout. Um, and you know, also having faster systems, easy to use interfaces, this can really uh, lower those, those lines at, at voting poll locations, um, you know, so people can get in and get out and it just, it doesn't take as long. Um, and just hopefully overall have a more trustworthy system that, that people um, would feel comfortable going to vote. Um, so I'm gonna pass it to Colin. He's gonna talk a little bit about our blockchain. Thanks, Joe. Um, so many of you are probably wondering like, what the heck even is a blockchain? And I think it's, it'll be a good idea to give you some background information before we go into the technical nitty gritty of our project specifically. So the only thing you really need to know about blockchain is that it's just a different way to store data. So instead of having a centralized server normally where you would store information in a database or such, you would have these blockchains which are distributed across the network and then the network provides a consensus on what is the correct blockchain. So how it works is that data is stored in these or is encapsulated in these objects called blocks and then each block is hashed and then linked to the block next block in the chain. So what this does is it creates an immutable property of a blockchain where if someone were to change one single bit of data anywhere in, in any single block, the, the changes in the hash would propagate throughout the blockchain and it would um, basically ruin the, uh, verif uh, it would ruin the validity of the entire blockchain. So this provides a really nice basis for um, as long as the consensus is correct and uh, the, the node is, or the network is working towards the correct consensus, the um, information in the blockchain will always be secure and it will always be valid. Thanks, Colin. So our system is a few key topics that were taken into consideration when working on our design. The most important of these being security. When implementing a polling system that has the potential to be used nationwide, Security is the biggest aspect that we need to assess. First of all, our system must be able to ensure that every voter's sensitive information remains confidential. Secondly, we must be able to accurately verify each voter's identity. We cannot allow any situation where a user could falsify their identity. Finally, we must ensure the integrity of each ballot's information. There must be a measure in place to prevent the tampering of data so whatever the user inputs gets recorded without any change at any time. The second consideration was with regards to our system's environmental footprint. We must consider ways to keep our energy consumption low within our system. Another consideration involves social aspects of our application. We wanna create a system that encourages voters to participate in, the, in their democratic duties. On the flip side of this, while we wanna encourage voters to use our product, we cannot allow our system to produce any kind of bias that could sway results. Finally, due to the sheer number of users using our polling machines, we must use an interface that is both ergonomic and easy to use. And now Colin's going to talk about our design process. I mean, Austin, sorry. Thanks, Matthew. So no for our design process, we went through several phases to get to the final product that we are demonstrating today. We started by brainstorming how we wanted to achieve the objectives that we laid out for this project. And once we had a clear path forward, we decided to consult with our academic advisor, Professor Momley, who has a background in security and secure coding practices to ensure that we were going to achieve, especially the security objectives, in a sane way, especially ones that were condoned by industry practices. So once we had a clear project roadmap after we brainstormed and consulted with Professor Molmi, we laid everything out in a project roadmap and we divided the project in what we called modules. 
so that we could work on different pieces of the project independently and in parallel. And then at the end, bring it all together like a puzzle piece. And that allowed us to stay on pace with what we planned out in our Gantt chart. And in order to make sure that we were staying on that pace and also keeping track of the development of the individual modules, we laid ourselves out a Trello board, which you can see pictured here on the slide. And that just made sure that we were keeping track of all the work and then keeping pace with everything to make sure we would reach um, the date that we had set out for ourselves and the different milestones. So for the components, what you're viewing here is a high level architecture diagram of the system that we're gonna be demonstrating today. And the system is really tied together by one central wireless router. And what we were going for was to simulate three physical locations. And the way that we did this with one physical device was using virtual, uh, three different virtual local area networks called VLANs. And that allowed us to do this with one device rather than three separate ones. So the first uh, physical location that we have that we're simulating is a central data center and that houses a MySQL database. And we'll go into what that database uh, serves in the process of the project a little bit later on, but that's what the data center is, is hosting that MySQL database. And then you have the two physical polling sites that we decided to go with. This one here has one additional hardware piece and that is a network switch since we had two devices on it rather than just one. So that's just another way in which you could expand the number of devices you have per site is with a network switch. So very low, um, overhead would be required to expand the number of devices you have per site. So the Raspberry Pis are what we're using to simulate the voting machines in our project. And at a high level, these voting machines are hosting two things. They're hosting the voter interface and they are hosting the blockchain backend code. And we're about to go into the particular functions of each of those pieces. And Ryland's gonna go ahead and dive into the component of our interface tools. Okay, so for the interface, we chose to code in Python 3 because it is the most recent version of Python and we all have had experience with it. And in Python, we chose the PyQt5 modules to develop the interface. And we did this because PyQt5 is designed so that the functionality and the user interface are in separate scripts. And this allows us to work on the program in a modular fashion, like Austin was talking about earlier. So not only could we work on the front and back end separately, but we could also divide up the separate pages of the user interface. Um, and it does this through utilizing signals and slots. So a signal is emitted when an event occurs, like when a user selects the ne next button, and a slot is called when an event signal is emitted, like how the interface saves the user's selection and moves to the next page when the next button is selected. And now Colin will talk about some authentication. All right, so um, when, we are, when we want to authenticate users, we need to make sure that throughout the entire process that we maintain voter anonymity at all times, and we keep the same security standards that we need for the entire um, device. So what we decided on doing is um, using that central database, the, um, the voting nodes um, query it with, um, or when a, when a user is, when, when a user is, uh, comes to a voting machine, they're given a user ID and a password. And what they use this password for is that when they log into the machine, the machine then queries the database and pulls that specific information, which is um, a public key and a private key pair that is already generated for them. Now we can't just store the regular private key in the, in the uh, database in plain text. We have to encrypt it using um, AES. So what happens is that the user's password is what used to encrypt the private key in the database. And then once the, once they log into the system, they then um, decrypt the private key. And if it successfully decrypts, then we know that that person is successfully authenticated. And if it doesn't decrypt, then we know that they are not authenticated. Thanks, Colin. Now I'm going to explain how our backend was designed and implemented. So a blockchain consists of two main portions, the ledger and the consensus protocol. We implemented this using Python. We chose Python because it's a language that we were all comfortable with, and we found the most existing literature on implementing blockchains through this language to use as the basis 
the basis of some of our code. We needed an efficient way to store ballot information within our blockchain. So we decided to store this information in JSON formatting due primarily to its uh, compatibility with Python. This allowed us to modularize the system resulting in easy communication between other components such as the interface and adjacent nodes. After finalizing design choices of our ledger, we decided that the best consensus protocol for our system was a proof of authority implementation. This method is based on reputation as opposed to other algorithms that rely on computational power or currency. So with this method, we're able to use our verified polling nodes as the facets of authority. This uh, limits both the risk of being compromised and computational power needed while improving our transaction speed. Microsoft is currently implementing this strategy in their Azure private networks. So on the next slide, you can see the code of our blockchain consists of three Python files. The bulk of this code is native to our blockchain file. This consists of a block class, a chain class, and functions used to read and write the verified blockchain to and from the nodes. Our main file is perpetually running to listen for incoming blocks from adjacent nodes. Once a node is ready to send a block to be verified, TCP functions library is referenced to interact between the nodes. We used a TCP handshake protocol to ensure that only potential blocks from verified nodes are processed. And now Austin is going to explain our hardware. Thanks, Matt. So the hardware that we decided to use for the voting machines, as I explained in the architecture diagram, were Raspberry Pis. And we decided to go with these devices because they represent a strong value as they're relatively capable computing machines, a compact form factor, which means they can be used for multiple different applications and use cases. And the operating system that we have running on these Raspberry Pis is Ubuntu Mate. Um, and Ubuntu is a well-known Linux distribution um, that has very good support that comes with it. And Mate is just a flavor of that Linux distribution. And the reason why we decided to go with this combination of that flavor and that distribution is because Ubuntu Mate has custom made images that are compatible with the Raspberry Pi models that we deployed on our blockchain network. And without further ado, it is time to get into the live product demonstration. And we have the video as a backup in case we run into any technical issues, but we're hoping for the best here, so let's go ahead and dive into it. So as I go through the product demonstration, the individual members of the team that uh, develop the individual components are gonna explain and walk you through what's going on, and Rylan's gonna start off by explaining what's happening here on our login page as I get yes. the credentials. So yeah, Austin's about to grab the credentials, and this would happen in a polling place after a voter showed a valid ID to the trustee and then they would give them these credentials. And then, uh, yeah, Colin talked about this some earlier, but they would enter them into the login page. Once they press submit, it would connect to a database that we have the encrypted RSA keys and the voter ID stored. And so it, it retrieves the encrypted ID using the voter ID. And then once it does that, it attempts to decrypt the encrypted RSA key and if it cannot decrypt the key, then they're un unauthentic and they will not be let into the, the ballot. But if it is authenticated, then um, we use the, the key later to digitally sign the ballots. Yeah, so once they get logged in, they're uh, presented with the, the first page of the ballot. Um, and just kind of some cool things we have built into our application interface, uh, kind of behind the scenes. So. Uh, every page is built uh, to be responsive and fit any size screen. Uh, and the reason we did this was just because we wanted that, you know, flexibility um, and for it to still look good, no matter what, if it's a big screen, small screen, you know, we just wanted to have it kind of fit. And we, we did this through vertical and horizontal layouts. Um, and then also, so when the user logs in, it builds their ballot. Um, and we have the, the program build the ballot based off a two dimensional array. And, and we pretty much did this because we know, different ballots are going to be in different areas. Um, so as long as it's in that two dimensional form, it'll make a ballot of whatever size with whatever questions and which whatever kind of responses. Um, so, so they'll go to the first page of the ballot, they'll see their question, they'll kind of see all their options below. 
And what the user does is they just choose the check box for who they want to vote for. Um, and we made sure it'll only allow for one selection. Um, and then also we gave the option to abstain uh, and kind of something we could add in is, you know, we could add in a write in option. Um, where they would just choose that and it would be a text input box and they just put who who they choose to write in. Uh, once they make their selection, they go to the next page um, and every page has a has a next button and um, a back button besides the first page, of course, because we don't want to go back to the login. Um, and then we also have it built in where they have to make a selection before they can change pages. So this ensures that, okay, they've made a selection for each page. Um, even if they choose to abstain, they still have to make that selection. They go to the next page. Um, you know, there's that little error message for them not making the selection. Uh, they just click OK. Uh, go ahead and make their selection. Um, and then it will load them up to the review page. So here they can go look, OK, are these the responses um, I wanted for each question? Um, if not, uh, we have the, the little no button down there. And what this will do is it'll lead them back to the first page of the ballot and they can go through the ballot, make whatever changes they want. Um, you know, so in this one, we want to change it to Will Conway for, for the president. We'll go next and then we just go back through the ballot. They can double check, make sure, okay, this is what I want. And then finally they get back, they see, okay, these are the results I want. And then they'll choose to click this yes button um, and cast their vote. Um, and what this does, it sends it uh, in a JSON format to our blockchain. They get a nice little notification that their ballot has been submitted. Um, then they click OK, and then it returns the login screen for the next user. All right, so now we're going to go through uh, uh, animation I made um, rather hastily um, to kind of give you an idea of how this works in the back end. Now, this animation isn't to scale of our actual network. It's just more to show the behavior and how everything interacts with each other. So we'll start it right here with a person at a polling station. What they'll do is they'll input their ballot data and then the, the, um, the polling station will encapsulate it with, in a block with metadata and their digital signature. This is then duplicated and spread out across the entire network. And then we'll zoom in on a particular node. When it takes in a specific block that it gets, it'll um, relay it to the other nodes that it's connected to. And then once everything is digitally signed and verified, it will um, add it to its blockchain. That, and that will come after the, uh, the entire consensus is passed for the entire network. Thanks, Colin. So as you're about to see within our aggregate data, after each ballot is submitted, the blockchain on the nodes are updated to include the new ballot information. So as you can see, before the ballot was cast, there was only one block in the chain. And now the second one has been added, allowing us to view all existing votes on the chain. So, so some conclusions, sorry about that. Uh, yeah, no, you're some, good. some conclusions we've drawn from uh, doing this project over the past two quarters are, of course, the current voting systems are deprecated and in need of innovation. Uh, our system improves upon the current systems and costs, security, reliability, and voter turnout. It does this through utilization of blockchain technology in combination with methods from the current voting process that work well, and of course, anonymity is maintained by not linking a voter's name to their vote. And now Austin will talk about some recommendations. So the recommendations that we came to as we worked through developing this project are that maintaining control and security of data is becoming increasingly important, especially as more sensitive data is being kept by digital systems, especially voting systems. And more care needs to be taken in regards to securing voting systems especially um, as we saw the aftermath of the 2016 presidential election, which is what led us to uh, embark on this project and seeing what ways there are to better secure the voting systems in our country. The use of blockchain for the purpose of securing voting systems is something we think should be explored further as blockchain is a relatively new technology that could offer many unforeseen benefits on top of the obvious uses 
that we've covered and this project and the research projects that we've consulted in developing our project to see what new aspects we could bring to the table. So what have we covered today in this presentation? So we went over the project goals of Easy Vote Secure, increasing the security of the voting system, reducing its cost, and also increasing voter turnout. And we also went over the key components of our project, the user interface, authentication, blockchain, and hardware. And that also included the demos that we went over as well. So with that, I'd like to um, open the floor to any questions that you all may have, and we will eagerly answer them. Thank you, Blockchain Gang, for that uh, great presentation. If you have any questions, feel free to raise your hand, and I'll acknowledge those. Otherwise, you can put them into the chat, and I'll answer them from there. Um, Freddie Johnson, who's a part of our Industrial Advisory Board, asks, slide 11, can you explain why you store the private key of each registered voter? Did you consider other options for storing the key, such as on the driver's license? Um, I'll go ahead and answer that. Uh, so yeah, we did um, c consider different options in storing the private key. This was probably the most actionable that we could do right now to, uh, to store the private key. The uh, thing is, is that like with other modes of, um, we didn't really want to have um, physical aspects to it because not only is that hard to do, it's also adds another layer of like, okay, if someone has something, they could take it and then use it to vote in the election. So we wanted to keep it to where, okay, we have someone verified in the, uh, we have someone verified by the trustees at the polling station. And then all they need to do is um, put in their ID and password into it. And plus, there's not really any risk to storing it in the, um, in the database anyways, because it's encrypted in the database. And they would need the person's specific password to decrypt it which is already a strong password and is pretty much unfeasible at that point. And to add on to that, another challenge that we considered when coming up with this solution is how to ensure that the vote being cast is not tied to the identity of the voter. So we wanted, when we were struggling with multi-factor authentication, you know, tying things such as a driver's license or things of that nature, we kept coming back to, well, that kind of ties the identity to the vote in a way. So this current solution we felt was the best way to, you go to the voting place and you get identified by a trustee that you're registered to vote. And then they would give you that voter ID and that randomly generated password. And that's what you would use to go through this decrypting process with the RSA keys. That's what we felt was the best balance of security and anonymity in this case. Holden Rose, who is a member of the Industrial Advisory Board, asked, are, are there data centers in each district of each state, or do the data centers have a way of separating what blocks come from so, which districts for recount purposes? Uh, I'll take care of this question. So inherently to the blockchain, there is no set data center where this is stored. Uh, the blockchain is stored on each individual polling node. Um, but specific to differences between districts, uh, within our JSON of the ballot information, there is a header that includes the district. So when sorting through the information uh, within the aggregate data, you could query by district to see within individual districts. All right, our, our final question is uh, from, also from Freddie, which blockchain did you use? So I'll, I'll take this one uh, again. So we used a, uh, Python-based blockchain framework that we found, uh, but most of uh, the actual blockchain we produced ourselves using the proof of authority um, protocol. But most of the actual contents of our blockchain was produced uh, through us in a problem. Awesome. Well, thank you, gentlemen, again, for your presentation. Um, the audience, if you could give them a, a spurring round of applause for their uh, contributions to today. All right, so as you guys exit, I will now introduce our final group presentation for today. We have the Connection Crew offering their presentation of ProtoNet, led by their leader, Alicia Centers. Alicia, are you ready? Yes, we are. All right, is your group all together? Uh, yes, we are all here. 
Awesome. Well, in that case, then I will leave you in the hands of Alicia Centers. All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Alicia Centers, and today our connection want group. To evaluate this I'm sorry. Go ahead, Alicia. Okay. Um, so hi everyone, my name is Alicia Centers and we are your connection crew and that is Merrick Watson, Kent Wilhelm, Brendan Mayhall, and Carrie Gustinger and we have designed Protonet. So the problem, in 2018 the FBI reported an estimated total loss of internet income that was internet that internet crime that exceeded 2.7 billion, triple that of 20 Adware Trojan worms and ransomware are just a few of the threats in our current world. So much of our have shifted from an to an online environment and it is common for individuals it is common for identifying information stored on the networks of many. It is common for you to have personal and identifying information on the networks of um, many organizations. The importance of network security is now crucial in order to stay safe. So our solution, when reaching the, re when researching the related projects on the market, we only found one that was similar to what we have envisioned, and that was the Graphics Network Simulator 3, or the GSN3. The application was similar um, of what we have envisioned, but it lacked one thing that we really wanted to focus on, which was security. Protonet, um, like seen before you, is a network prototyping tool that is able to generate secure and efficient network configuration. It allows you to input the number of nodes you need up to 30, and it gives you the network configuration to match that. And although we try to emphasize the importance of security, we know, we recognize that this isn't a priority for every single person. For this reason, ProtoNet also offers the option to generate network configurations that prioritize efficiency. So after discovering the application GSN3, we debated designing ideas in order to make our application stand out and be as professional as possible. Our first design idea is the one you see before you. It is a network of five workstations, one for efficiency and one for security. There we began coding the slides, coding our application and coming up with the best way to configure a network, network security. And that is where I'll hand it off to Carrie for our network research. Thank you, Alicia. So before we could start designing our application, we first needed to define what the terms secure and efficient would mean in the context of ProtonNet. We needed to do this because both of these terms have a very wide range of definitions. For example, secure could imply that the network design itself could find and eradicate malware. However, any network is only as secure as the components inside it. So what our secured network aims to do is to prevent the spread of malware to the major components of the network and protect the network from being infected entirely. So efficient also has many definitions. It could relate to power supply, minimal downtime, or the rate of data transfer. So in ProtoNet, we decided that efficient would describe a network that maximizes the rate of data transfer across the network. So to make sure that ProtoNet is used effectively, we wanted this to be clear to the user. So for this project, we wanted to first consider the basic network topologies and then explore the variations of each. We researched designs that were commonly used for secure and efficient networks and compared them. We considered the mesh topology, which had many connections, making it very efficient but not secure. So instead, we started to look at the star topology, which was one of the most common types of networks. The design shown on the left is a star topology. We found this design in both uh, efficient and secure networks. We also found variations of the star topology that were aiming to be more secure, like the extended star design in the middle. This design creates a higher average distance between the nodes and the server, and this layout helps minimize the connections to the server as well. However, we also found that the designs would change depending on the number of servers included. So the design on the right is the extended star design using multiple servers. 
For further protection, we did not want these servers to be directly connected to each other. So because uh, the number of servers would change the design and because we would be working with a, a mathematical algorithms, we did not want to limit ourselves to trying to design and use just one network topology. Instead, what we needed to do was look at the attributes of each network topology and identify what would make a network secure or efficient. Then we would be able to use these attributes in our algorithms to automatically generate the network design that fits best. So for a secure network design, we found that having fewer net connections per node would delay the spread of malware across the network. We also wanted to minimize the number of direct connections to servers to help protect them. For additional security, we decided to also use network segmentation using firewalls, which means we separate portions of the network into zones protected by those firewalls. However, for an efficient network, uh, we found that having more connections between nodes and servers would typically result in better speed. So these aspects are what we use to later develop the algorithms that Protonet uses to generate network configurations. So now we'll go to Kenton, who will uh, talk more about our design and implementation. Thank you, Carrie. Uh, let's, let's go ahead and talk about the actual application itself. So our application is built using Electron JS, which is a Chromium desktop application framework builder in JavaScript. Additionally, we use Node and NPM to load and manage the modules that we use, the most important of which being Bootstrap for better and more streamlined visuals, jQuery for easier HTML element management, and Sigma.js for our network graph editor. Finally, since the application is in Chromium, we use HTML, CSS, and JavaScript to build the pages. So for an overview of the front end, our application has three pages. We have a home page, a network page, and a security information page. On our home page is the terms and conditions, as well as a welcome and introduction for the user, giving them a bit of insight on how to use the application. The network page houses the network editor, which is the bulk of the project, and I'll get into more detail on that in a minute. The last page, the security information page, provides the user with some background and knowledge of networks and how to create a secure or efficient network. It provides most of the information that Carrie has just presented to you. Finally, we have a menu that appears on each page and allows for the user to traverse around the application. So looking at the network editor, uh, it is a page that holds the application's editor and viewer. It is written using the JavaScript library Sigma.js, and the page allows the user to design their own network topology as they like. They can create nodes which appear as different shapes based on the type of hardware that they are. Once a node is created, it can be moved around the canvas and edited at will. Additionally, users can create connections between nodes, which appear as lines connecting the shapes together. If a user doesn't want to make a network manually, they can automatically generate one by, speci by specifying the number of nodes. So a few details that will allow it to work. The editor is managed by a toolbar that resides above the network editor box. This toolbar houses all of the functionality and options of the graph editor. Clicking the different buttons allows you to create, remove, or move nodes around on the canvas. It also allows you to create or remove connections between said nodes. The functionality works for both user-defined and automatically generated network topologies. The network page also houses several pop-up modal boxes that allow the user to define details about nodes or configurations. They appear whenever an input is expected from a user, such as when a node is created and must be named, or when a node is double-clicked and renamed. It also appears to warn the user about any problems with their configuration, such as if they attempt to give two nodes the same name or add a 17th connection to a switch that only has 16 connections. Finally, the network generator has an interface on this page where the user can define their desired preference, secure or efficient, and set the number of nodes that it will create. For more on that network generator and the backend, I'm gonna hand it off to Brandon. Okay, thank you. I'll try and quickly go through all the components of the backend and how they work together to function within our, within our application. To start, I'll discuss the node class that we built, how we decided to store the network configuration, how we were able to modify these nodes when they were part of the network configuration, 
and how our application is able to auto-generate networks. All of these things were written in JavaScript. So to start, when we were designing the application, we decided to go with an object-oriented approach to programming. So we developed a node class, which is used to create objects for every piece of hardware on the network. The attributes of the node class can be grouped into three different categories. We have hardware ident identification, which holds the name, the brand, the model, the price, and the quality. And then we have physical attributes, including the number of WAN slash LAN ports, the ethernet bit rate, and the bit rates for wireless communication. And then we have functional attributes, including whether or not a node can communicate wirelessly, its X and Y values on the network page, the current connections it holds with other nodes, and the node type. And it can either be a server, a firewall, a switch, or a workstation. Some of these attributes weren't implemented. They were added in hope of future, uh, future functionality to be developed. So when deciding how to store the network configuration, we went with a single file to read and write from, and that holds the whole network configuration. Since we are working with objects, we decided to use a JSON format to store them. And this stands for JavaScript Object Notation. This is native to JavaScript and allows for easy interaction with these objects and other functions within JavaScript. All of these interactions are handled by a single file, modifynodes.js. And here at the bottom, you can see a simple example of how the backend can create a node. First, we have to instantiate the node object with all the relevant attributes. And then we convert that to a JSON format, and then we write it out to nodelist.json, the file that holds the network configuration. So we decided to have a single file to handle all the interactions between the network configuration and the application. This was done to make the development a little easier. If someone was to develop a function that had to interact with the network, they could reference an already written function that has all the relevant error handling and knows how to interact with the network configuration properly. The current functionality that we have implemented now is we can add and delete a node. We can create and delete a connection between two nodes. We can rename a node. We can add and update coordinates to a node on the network page. We can clear all the nodes from a network configuration and we can load and save a network configuration to a file to be used later. So on the right, we see a flowchart of the way the backend goes, away, uh, goes about creating a connection between two nodes. First, we start and we read the current network configuration from the node list.json file. And then we can iterate over each object and find the nodes by name. Then we must make sure that both of these nodes actually exist on the network. And if they do, then we must determine whether or not the connection already exists. If the connection does not exist and these two nodes exist on the network, we have to then check to make sure that there is an actually an available port available to make this connection. If all three of those conditions are satisfied, then we can successfully make the connection. We can update the connection attribute and then write the modified nodes out to the node list.json. If any, of those, if any of those conditions fail, then an error code is returned and the appropriate error message is shown to the user on the network page. So the last thing that we wanted our application to be able to do is to auto-generate networks. So we developed algorithms that can generate networks based on the desired number of workstations. These algorithms can either be made to generate an efficient network or a secure network. And they're intended to give the user a suggestion and guidance on how they should be building their networks. The user is then capable of editing their network to their liking after it has been generated. But due to the scope of the project, we decided to limit the workstations to a maximum of 30. So the first algorithm I'll discuss is the efficient one. We implemented Dijkstra's algorithm for path analysis to determine how efficient a network was. By determining the minimum cost path between nodes, we can determine how efficient that network actually is. So after testing several different kinds of topologies, we decided to settle on a hypothetical business network architecture. In this network, the user can define the number of workstations they intend to have on their network. These workstations are then connected to switches, and then these switches are connected to a central database for file storage slash sharing and then they're connected to a router in order to access the internet. 
On the right, we can see an example network diagram that this algorithm can produce. This is not an image from our application, it's just a diagram to reference. So as you can see, we have 28 workstations, and then these workstations are then in turn connected to the two switches. These switches are then connected to a router to access the internet, and then to a central database. So the next algorithm we developed was the secure algorithm. And we decided, and to develop this, we modified the efficient algorithm to implement more secure network practices, including network segmentation and firewall implementation. On the right, you can see another network diagram showing that the, the type of network that can be generated from this algorithm. And as, as you can see, it looks very different from the efficient. First, we see that the network is divided into several zones, as you can see, uh, dashed in orange. By segmenting the network into zones, the user can then evaluate specific security concerns for each zone, and then they can develop a set of firewall rules whenever they physically build the network. We also see that the switches are no longer connected directly to the server, and each zone is protected by a firewall. So now I'm gonna hand it over to Merrick so he can show our application in action. Thank you, Brendan. Um, as you can see, we are going to now jump into our actual pro product. This is Protonet. Uh, we begin by starting on the home page where it provides information on how to actually use this product, um, how to identify the different symbols, servers, switches, or routers, firewalls, and workstations. And finally, additional information about the product and how it's intended to be used. We intended this more to be educational or for business purposes for designing a network. Next, we'll jump into the more integral part of the product, the network configuration page. So the first thing a user would be prompted with is um, the settings they would like. Currently, we asked how many nodes they would like. This is the number of workstations they intend to have on their network. Our maximum capacity currently is 30, so we'll use that as our first demonstration. We can choose between two preferences, secure and efficient. We'll first demonstrate the efficient configuration. Now, as this generates, it fits a similar uh, model as Brendan has shown earlier. As you can see, it's separated between two switches connected to edge router and a server structure, and they are fairly divided between the two. Next, we'll move on to our secure system. You can freely switch between the two, and as long as the number of nodes is the same, it will reset and redesign the system. This, again, follows similar to what Brennan has shown earlier, as now is implemented firewall structures. Firewalls between the network-facing router, firewalls between the switches, and a firewall between the server system. This is to help the user understand that you want something to bridge between your servers and your fire and your switches so each workstation has different inbound and outbound rules. Lastly, we could show that this works with other node amounts. So we'd like to change this to say 18. You want a smaller system. Again, we are going to make it under the secure pretense and generate it. As you can see, this has many much fewer workstations than before, and a few are still having to be relegated to a second switch. This, get, this shows that we are capable of working with a variant amount of workstations. And now I'll show you the actual capabilities of this tool. If they want to develop their own network, they can add their own nodes, as I will demonstrate now. And you're allowed to name it. It will quickly prompt you, what do you want? And you can even choose what type of hardware. For now, we're going to keep it a workstation. For example, we'll call this Dr. Gates's computer and it will quickly try to create this. To show our error handling, we can try to add a connection for Gates' PC and attempt to connect it to the switch. As you can see, it, is, it currently has all ports connected to a different item, so it cannot connect this. However, we can remove a connection, say we no longer have workstation four, and we should be able to remove it. I think if I can highlight this, We'll remove workstation five as I'm unable to actually you click that link. But now one less connection exists, so we can freely connect Gates PC to the switch. 
quickly makes this. We are also capable of removing nodes from the system as Workstation 5 is no longer there. We can just remove it from the network. You're also freely allowed to move them around. This still keeps all their connections intact and you can move and redesign the network as one fits, one sees fit. Lastly, we are given the ability to rename. So if you double click a node, it prompts you with what you would like to rename it to. For an all intents and purposes, let's say it is now my PC. And now it has been renamed. The last page I'd like to direct us to is the security information page. This, as Carrie has described, shows our reasoning and logic behind why we have gone with this system. It shows our reasoning of what efficient and secure is and explains to the user why they would like to proceed with these practices. It helps them in the long run and informs them of our goals and aspirations for the product. And that is our demo of ProtoNet. I'd like to, pat, or I'd like to continue with future implementations that we've considered for our product. Given more time and a slightly larger scope, there's possible implement implementations we have considered. The first would of course be algorithm efficiency. We have currently restricted ourselves to 30 nodes and we would love to have increased this number. As we have improved the code, we have seen our uh, maximum cap of workstations be increased more and more. But other things we'd like to have considered were in the network diagram themselves. We've considered simulations themselves be useful for this system as it would allow the user to test packet travel or malware travel throughout the network. So that giving them the capability of um, a virus hitting workstation two and seeing how that could possibly reach the server. Next, we would have liked to implement firewall rules as inbound and outbound rules are a common occurrence in any business nowadays. And this would re recreate more real world practice in our simulated environment. As we've introduced, we have, uh, we have hardware capabilities such as wireless functions, but they are unused. We would have liked to seen this be used later in the system. And again, we have more than enough uh, different types of hardware, but we do not interact with them currently. We'd love to give users more freedom in choosing what hardware they want to represent in the system. The last thing we have considered was our class structure. Currently all of our objects are one node class. We have realized this is an issue as more and more hardware devices while sharing a majority of systems do not share all systems. We would love to have separated the shared item or attributes in this case into a superclass and the remaining objects into a subclass system, giving user more interaction between them. And I'd like to pass it back to Alicia for a question and answer. Any questions? I thank the connection crew for your presentation. Um, if there are any questions, feel free to raise your hand and I will um, go to you. Otherwise you can ask your question in the group chat and I will try to get to it from there. So we have a question from Holden, who is a part of the Industrial Advisory Board. He said, did you consider VLAN creation? Uh, Merrick? Um, currently, we did not. We were only considering um, physical devices so far, but it would theoretically be possible to do virtual devices. Other questions from the group? All right. Anyone have a question, a uh, hand raise or a, a comment? ask. So Bill Bradley often has asked the other groups what was their most challenging uh, part of this project and how did they uh, overcome it? So I'll ask that same question to you guys. What was your most challenging aspect of this project and how did you overcome it? I'd say our most challenging project definitely getting started. We had um, some communication issues and just trying to get the app up and going. Um, it was really hard to just kind of configure the application initially. 
Um, once we got it configured, we were able to overcome it. We created Trello boards that were able to help us keep up with uh, different sprint-like um, weeks. And then we also have a group uh, chat where we were constantly interacting with each other and we had weekly meetings um, every week in order to make sure that um, goals were met every single week and that people were performing at the best that they could and that if people had issues we were able to overcome that especially during uh, COVID-19 right now it that was the most important part for all of us is to just really stay communicating as much as possible and to just kind of be there to help out if someone couldn't perform. Awesome. So Josh Klein Peter a member of the Industrial Advisory Board asked what classes in your curriculum helped you prepare for this project? Uh, networks helped a lot. <laughs> that was probably the most um, straightforward answer I could probably give you is that networks was the biggest class that helped us. Uh, but definitely going back to our um, 120 and our, um, our initial CSC classes where we learned how to code and learned how to um, learned how to create those classes and learned how to work with JavaScript. Um, those were our most fundamental classes in helping build this application to make sure we built it right. I would also like to add data structures were very important as we went object oriented and we were building these different things and industrial, uh, industrial network control securities that helped us figure out how we could make network secure, including network segmentation and firewall implementation. And there were many other things that we could have addressed if we had more time to add more secure components and more simulations and stuff like that. Absolutely. Any other questions? Other questions? If not, we want to thank uh, the connection crew for their presentation of ProtoNet. I hope to see that in uh, production soon <laughs> and patented, by the way. Holden, all right. We do have one more question from Holden. Holden asks, can I build a network and then have the software optimize it or build it to show me the best way to expand my network? So in the current build, we can't, but that was part of the future implementation uh, using uh, Dijkstra's path analysis and budget considerations, we were going to implement a way that you could provide a budget you have, and then it could even upgrade the different types of hardware to a higher quality hardware if that made the network more efficient. So in the current build, we can't do that, but that was definitely something that we were intending to build if we had more time. You could create your network in the application itself. Um, and then you could choose a secure network configuration with the number of nodes that you were using and have it do that. But um, it was not actively able to um, change the network you had already created. Okay. Right, any final questions for Connection Crew? Well, we thank you all for um, your presentation. If you could give them a round of applause as a group, very job, very well done, I must say. All right, um, thank you. All right, well, with no further questions, that will conclude the presentation from Connection Crew, which also concludes the presentations from the Cyber Engineering Senior Capstone uh, groups. I hope that you enjoyed them all. They were all equally impressive. And um, everyone stay safe. Thank you.